researching tattoo history since 2004. He started tattooing in 1979 and tattooed for nine years and is still very much a part of the world of tattooing. And we have Dorothy Shaw, nay Haywood. She's a former tattoo artist, originally from Oldham, but has been in Blackpool for most of her life. And that's where she tattooed. Um, and she still lives there by all accounts. Dot. Um, Dorothy ranks among the very few professional female tattoo artists that operated in Britain at that time in the 50s and 60s. So welcome both of you and thank you for joining us. I hope you're not too hot, the heat tonight. No, no good. <laughs> Fine just now. <laughs> That's great. Um, so if we can start with you, Terry. Um, yes. So you were, formerly you were a tattoo artist. Yeah. Uh, right. And I believe you made your very own machine. I made my first machine when I was 14. So I was an early starter. You were an early starter. How did you go about making your own machine? Because that takes... There was no place to buy a machine. You, you didn't know where to get this stuff back then. This was in the, the late 70s. And I had no idea where to, to purchase a machine or, I knew nothing about tattooing. I just wanted to be a tattooist. And I realized that machines were what people used in professional shops, but I, I couldn't find one anywhere, you know, and I was, I was too young, I was only 13, 14. So I made my own machine out of an alarm clock. I think we have a couple of images there. Um, if we could right. have a look. I think it's the second image. She here or Matt? Oh, back, back, back. That's it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is what you made. Well, that's a, that's a homemade tattoo machine. And without any electrical knowledge, there was no way that I could build a tattoo machine. So I just used the workings of an alarm clock and I attached a needle, very like these pictures. And I used to wind it up and do a line and then wind it up and do another line. Wow. And that's how, that's how I started tattooing. That sounds like a long process. Who did you uh, practice on or who did you start on? It was all school friends, neighbors, you know, stuff like that. The, the, the tattooing wouldn't be anything great, but it was a step up from tattooing with a needle in Indian ink. So that was the progression. I started hand tattooing, first of all, and then I moved on to making my own machine when I was 14. And then by the time I was 16, I had actually came across a newspaper advertisement for tattooing equipment. And uh, if you go to slide three, you'll see the advert at the bottom there. Yeah. That was a company called Ultra Tattoo Supplies in Bradford. And I saw that advert in 1979 and I sent away for a catalog and the catalog came back and it was full of tattoo machines, designs, inks. And that's how I got more into it, you know, with the better equipment. Brilliant. Uh, by, by, by going to that company and lots of guys of my age will have entered the tattoo business using this same company. And you had to send three nine-piece stamps for full-color brochure, right? That's correct, so, yes. How much, was it, how much was the machine? Well, the machines, I think, were about between 30 and 50 pounds, as far as I remember, and I spent 200 pounds. Wow. On, I bought two machines and I bought all yeah. the other associated you know, equipment. You were very determined by the sound of it. I mean, to make your own tattoo machine, first of all, from a, from a clock, an alarm clock. Brilliant. What actually, just to um, tell us, what was it about tattoos that made you, that gave you that drive to do that, that you wanted to be a tattoo artist? Well, my father was very heavily tattooed. He was in the Royal Navy. I had uncles that were very heavily tattooed. I, I just loved tattoo art from when I was seven or eight years old. I was obsessed by it and I, I was a good artist. I was the guy that you would come to to draw a picture. I was the guy you would come around and get your, you know, your motorbike helmet painted. I was ah. the guy that painted your motorbike tank. You know, I, I was just good at drawing that kind of thing. I can't draw a portrait and I can't draw a landscape, but I was always good at drawing 
what I had seen when I was younger, you know, snakes and panthers and love hearts and all that kind of traditional tattooing. So that's what got me into it. I could draw that. And it, it, for me, it felt natural. And I, I always said that I would be a tattoo artist. And I actually made it, you know, so I was very young when I decided that. And I was determined to open a shop, you know, and see it through. So, and, you did. and you did that. Where did you open your shop? I opened my shop in Airdrie in 1984. Okay. So I was quite young. I was only, I was less than 20 at the time. And I was very young, but I'd been tattooing for quite a few years in the house at this point. So I had quite a bit of experience working in the house, but running a tattoo shop is a completely different thing than tattooing in your own house. Running a tattoo shop back then was a rough business. You know, it wasn't what you see now when you go in and you make an appointment and you have a consultation and you see a receptionist. When I was tattooing, you came in, you sat down and you waited up to 10 hours to be tattooed. Oh, wow. That's, That's dedication. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, who was the designer of the first uh, electric tattoo machine? Well, tattoo, uh, electric tattooing has come from America. So mm -hmm. Samuel O'Reilly would be the, the sort of grandfather of tattooing, electric tattooing. He developed the machine and it was certainly prevalent in America, especially New York, uh, back in the sort of 1880s, 1890s, that kind of time. And that's where electric tattooing started, and it's where sort of professional tattooing started, because once the machine came along, you could then make a business of it. You could tattoo, you know, 20 people a day. If you were tattooing oh, right. a man, you could only do two or three, you know, so it, it made it commercially viable. And that is where it's been agreed that that is where electric tattooing had started in New York. Right. And you, you, you can trace its roots from there to Britain. Mm -hmm. you know, because lots of our, you know, sailors who were over in New York at that time, they would see electric tattooing for the very first time. And one of the strange things was back then, lots of tattoo artists sold equipment. So if you were getting tattooed, they would also offer to sell you the equipment. And right. lots of the guys who went over there at that time in the 1890s, mm -hmm. if they were sailors, they would get that opportunity to get their hands on an electric tattoo machine. And that's where lots of them came back to this country and then when they came to this country, lots of guys who seen it made their own based on that same design. Okay, brilliant. And you've been researching, you said, since 2004? Yes. Yeah, what, what sort of got you into that? Because it's a different thing to be tattooing someone and then look into the histories and try and find out, because you've really done like a deep dive in researching, as you told me before. What, what drove you to that? What got you into research? I think for me, when I was growing up, I only ever heard one name in tattooing, and it was Prince Valor. And I always thought that was some kind of magical name you know, some kind of made up name, a, a, you know, a mythical figure. But <laughs> Prince Valor was actually a man who tattooed in Glasgow. And he tattooed in Glasgow from 1905 right through to his death in 1947. Right. And I started to investigate his life to see if he was a real person. And once I got started, you know, I found Valor. And when I found Valor, I found the man who trained Valor, whose name was Joe Kilbride. Aha, okay. And then that built out because it went on and on and on. And, you know, every guy was connected. Okay, so we're going to have a look at three of the early pioneers uh, of tattooing in the UK this evening, yep. as well as Dot. Um, so before we um, go to Dot, um, can you start off and tell us, uh, why you chose these three guys? Because I know you have extensive research on many people. Why these three pioneers? I think I've chose these guys because lots of tattooing history is written around three or four guys. Mm -hmm. You know, George Burchett, 
Alfred South, Sutherland MacDonald, and Tom Riley. There's lots of stuff written about these guys. Yeah. But there was a whole other cast of guys working round about them. There was lots of them at that time, and they've never been mentioned. So in my research for Prince Father, when I found Joe Kilbride, Joe Kilbride was really one of the old tattoos, one of the very first guys. And Joe had been in the Merchant Navy, and he had been out in New York, and he had purchased the equipment, and he had brought it back to this country. So he had a head start before the turn of the, 19th, you know, the 20th century. Joe was well ahead of the game. And he really was a journeyman tattooist by the time the 1900s came along. He had been an early adopter of it. And as I say, he trained Prince Fala. So that, that just goes to show you the lineage that was all the way through. You know, Kilbride was a very underrated tattoo artist. Um. And I, like, from here, he, he tattooed in Bradford Hall, Grimsby, Dublin, Belfast, London, and New York. So yeah. he travelled extensively. He did. Um, I like the fact that he's called Professor. Is that just <laughs> the name that he decided to... We can see by a few of the people tonight, actually, they've all got names like Prince, Princess, Professor. Was that a common yeah. thread throughout yes. the tattoo artists? Uh, I don't think you could call yourself doctor, even back then. So okay. professor's the next <laughs> best thing, you know. And lots of these guys use these kind of titles for themselves, you know. And, and you'll see that on the business card that says Professor Pat Kilbride. Mm -hmm. Well, that came later in his life because uh -huh. his nickname was Paddy. Okay. So, and he, he wasn't Irish. He had no Irish connections at all. He was actually adopted by a, a family in Bradford who were a well-known boxing family called the Kilbrides. And that's how Joe came from the maritime side and how he got into the carnival side. When he got involved with the Kilbride family, he was on the side shows, the carnivals, traveling with the circus. He was artistic because he had previously worked as a scenic artist. So he definitely had artistic skill, mm -hmm. and he adapted that into tattooing, and he took his tattooing all over Britain and all over Ireland, and he appears everywhere. If you look at the records, he's, you know, as you say, he was in Morecambe, he was in Islington, he was in Dublin, Belfast. He moved around constantly all through his life, very much like the other showmen that we're going to talk about, Charlie Bell. Yeah, and so... <clears throat> Joe Kilbride, would he, would he have had a, a parlour of his own or a setup that it was permanent or not? No. He didn't. He, Joe was very uh, itinerant. He moved from place to place. He would set a shop up. That's one thing that he would do. But he never stayed very long. He was always on the move. And I think because he was, he, like all these guys, they were always running from something. Joe was married, <laughs> Joe was married three times. Okay. <laughs> and he never got divorced. He just kept getting remarried. Okay. You know. So that was what Joe did. He just kept moving. He had more children. He moved again. He had more children. And he left quite a trail behind him. And his story is one of the most interesting that I've ever researched. How long was he going for? How long did his sort of like spate of tattooing last? Joe died in 1945. And in his later years, he wasn't actively tattooing. He always tattooed. But in his later years, he became a show producer. Uh -huh. He was putting on plays and, you know, doing things in theatres. He always tattooed. But as he got older, that wasn't something that he was actively pursuing as a business. So he was, um, as well as being a tattoo artist, he was a showman. He was a showman through and through. There's no doubt about that. That was his... His life, he loved to perform. You know, he was a great self-promoter. So An empresario, uh, even empresario. That's the exact word for yeah. him. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what else can we move on from that clip now, guys? Yeah. Um, what was it about Joe Kilbride that I mean that gets you? That is it because of his lineage? Because he was doing it for so long? 
Yeah, I think for me, uh, as a historian researching these things, yeah. I, always go, I always go by longevity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've done something for 20 or 30 years, for me, that ticks all the boxes. You know, if you've lasted in your chosen profession, no matter what it is, that ticks the boxes for me. I love that. Uh, and these guys, I've chose these guys because they all had long, long uh, associations with tattooing in Britain. You know, Charlie Bell, who's on the screen now, Charlie was a 50-year veteran. Prince Valor was a 50-year veteran. And Joe O'Brien was a plus 50-year veteran. So these guys really had a big footprint in British tattoo history. Yeah. But you'll never see anything written about them. The, the, the life's just passed by. And they were always, you know, swept aside in favour of George Burchett and MacDonald and Riley, the better known London tattoos. Yeah, yeah. But there was, there was a full history of tattoo artists all over Britain. And in World War I, when World War I broke out, there was at least 70 tattooists working in Britain that I've recorded. That's, that's a that's lot. Incredible. Yeah, because when I tattooed in the 80s, there was only 50 tattoo artists or 55 tattoo artists working in the whole of Britain. And there was only 12 or 13 in Scotland. Right. Well, I mean, that's, a, so there's a lot and a lot of history to get through. I mean, we, that's why we've only picked three this evening as well. One of the things I was going to say actually, um, was to last that long in tattooing, obviously you've got to have a good reputation, but also the fact that the machines were very heavy and I've talked to many tattoo artists, the, especially the old machines, very heavy, electrical, took a lot of um, physical you know, strength. Yeah. And a lot of people had to give up because it ruined, they couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. So these guys happened to last that long, they're still going strong. It's, well, it's unusual. Well, yeah. What I like to look at is I like to look at the fact that most of these guys pass their trade on to their children. So Charlie Bell taught his son, Charles Jr. Ah. So they had that, you know, 60, 70 year uh, dynasty. And Valor trained his son as well. Now, Joe Cobride, his son didn't take it up. But the Valors and the Bells are massive names in British tattoo history. Mm -hmm. that don't get that recognition. And that's what I, I, I love to highlight the fact that, first of all, they were there a long time themselves, and then they passed it on to their children. So it wasn't just that great 50 year, it was the other 30 years after that as well. And that is what is really impressive to me looking at it. Okay, let's move to Charlie Bell. As you were just saying, I think he comes from my neck of the woods, which is Brixton. Yes. What can you tell us about Charlie? Well, Charlie was born in Brixton and his father wanted him to have a job in the city. But Charlie's older brother, Walter, he was a singer and performer, a dancer. He worked in variety. He worked all over Britain. And as soon as Charlie was 14 years old, he joined his brother and he became a, a performing artist, a dancer. Charlie did uh, comedy sketches. You know, he... He loved to be on stage. That was... That, that's okay, sorry, Terry, just for a sec. There's something going on with your mic there. I don't know okay. if you've moved away from it. It's a little bit... Are you okay? Is that okay? Sounds a little bit dodgy there. Um, right, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear you perfect now. Yes, good stuff. Right. Okay. Okay. So Charlie was a stage performer and... When he was performing, he met a guy called Jim Ivory. And him and Jim Ivory teamed up as a duo. And Jim Ivory was a top tattoo artist at the turn of the century. And he had a wife called Ethel, who was a tattooed lady. And Charlie must have got the idea that he would also become a tattoo artist and that he would also have a tattooed wife. But Charlie wasn't married. So Charlie met this young girl called Christine Duncan and Christine was only 14 at the time and he persuaded her to become fully tattooed. So Christine got completely tattooed when she was, you know, 14, 15. Very and her and Charlie 
went on the road together and they performed all over Britain. They went everywhere. And they got married about six or seven years later. And they continued to travel. But like all these guys, once they had a family, you know, as soon as they had children, they couldn't travel as much anymore. Ah, oh, yeah. They had to curtail that in some way. So these guys that were traveling, like Joe Kilbride, like Charlie Bell, were moving from place to place. But once you have children in tow, you can't move around like that. So lots of these guys would pick a place and settle down. So Charlie settled in Chatham. And uh, unfortunately, when, when they came off the road, Christina became unwell and she died very young. But she had had a 30 year career, uh, you know, showing herself at carnivals and exhibitions and stuff like that. Can we see a slide of uh, Christina, please? There's some, there's Christina there looking beautiful and yeah, heavily tattooed. So it's not a new thing, women with tattoos all over their bodies. However, um, you did tell me before as well, Terry, that they were careful not to have any on their necks yeah. or their hands. So they could be fully dressed and nobody would know any different. That's right, yeah. There was still that stigma back then, but um, to make money on the circuit, the younger and the better looking you were, the more money you would make. It's as simple as that. It's like even now, you know, it's all about you know how you look and whatever yeah, else. Yeah, nothing's and, changed. Yeah, yeah, nothing's changed. So Christina would be a fantastic draw. There was an element of voyeurism in it. So to see a semi-naked lady, you know, at the carnival was a big draw, and that's what they played on. You know, Christina was beautiful. She was advertised as the most beautiful tattooed lady in Europe. And this is how her and Charlie drew the crowds. This is how they made their living. This is how they made their money. Because a lot of these uh, tattooed ladies, uh, from what you've told me before and now, they were very young. They started young, 15, 14. Do you think that they, I mean, was it a case they were being exploited? Or do you think actually that was a job? They could make good money. They met someone and it was an opportunity. What would you say? I, yeah, I think it's the opportunity. The money was incredible. You know, the money was limitless. And if you read about Christina's life, what they would do is she would arrive in town and they would advertise her presence. They would put posters up and lots of guys would buy a ticket, you know, for a penny to get into the tent. And she would stand on a box. She was wearing an overcoat. And for the first part of the show, she would, she would drop down her top and she would show her chest and her arms. And as the show went on, she would then take the coat off completely and let them see her legs. And then at the end of the show, Charlie would announce that he would sell them an envelope for a penny. And in that envelope, you would get a photograph of Christina that you could take home with you. And there would also be a, a handwritten proverb in there, like a fortune cookie. And that's what you would get for your penny. And it was an extra way to make money for them. That's how they survived. And as you said, there's a voyeuristic aspect to this because we have to remember in the, those days, people didn't get to see semi-naked ladies, women. Yes. Uh, it was unusual. There wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't available so much. So this was quite a draw just to see a woman in state of undress and tattooed. Yes, definitely. It was unusual, first of all, to see somebody semi naked. Yeah. But it was even more unusual to see them completely tattooed. And what do we know? I mean, what happened to these um, tattooed ladies? Because if it was about their youth and their beauty, did they have a short shelf life? I mean, what happened? To, what, what did they end up doing? Well, Christina died very young, so she came off the road. But the other ladies, I mean, Joe Kilbride, Joe was married three times, and his second wife was an Irish lady from Cork, and uh, she was called Madam Eileen, the Irish Colleen. I think we have a couple. Yeah, these are brilliant. That's her there, That's her there on the left-hand side of the screen. That was Joe's second wife. And she went out, and she, she showed herself at carnivals. 
and they reckon that she also tattooed as well. Okay. So she had that skill as well, apparently. Multi-talented. Multi-talented, and that was the way to make money. You know, she would draw the crowds in, and Joe would tattoo them. How long, do you know how long they w would be tattooing for? Like, how long would that, would they just do one little tattoo at a time, or uh, for the exhibition? For the exhibition, they one at a time, yeah, definitely. Yeah. They wouldn't spend too much time doing anything too detailed. But uh, you can see she's got great coverage. She has some great tattoos. I've what? looked at them quite yeah. closely. You know, what great, kind of great stuff? Artwork. What kind yeah. of things were there tattooed? It's, it's kind of hard for me to sell, put my glasses on, but... There's lots of religious symbols, that kind of thing. You know, she's got lots of stuff on the legs, angels and, and stuff like that. Serpent around her neck, that kind of thing, you know. Okay. She's completely covered. And that's, that, that, that's obviously, there's a lot of work in that, you know. And, and Joe's obviously completely covered her. And then in later years, that lady on the right-hand side, her name is Queenie Morris. Now, Queenie Morris was famous long before she met Joe Kilbride. Okay. She was a stage comedian. You know, she was an actress. And she, as her career went on, you know, she got less and less work. Variety fell away. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as popular. So she became fully tattooed. And she travelled with Joe. And she exhibited as well. Okay. So Joe, Joe Kilbride and Charlie Bell and lots of these guys persuaded their wives to get fully tattooed. But as time went on, these ladies would become less in demand. Their looks would be fading. The tattooed lady was not as big a draw, you know, as, as, as the years went on, because tattooing was now no longer new, no longer secretive, you know. Uh -huh. So in the 40s and the 50s, that was the end of the tattooed ladies. Death. Okay, the novelty was gone, yeah. I mean, Queenie Morris there, she's got, so, she just looks like she'd be great fun. <laughs> well, she at, at the end of Queenie's life, she was an alcoholic. Oh. And she was very difficult, apparently. Uh, I've, I've talked to Joe Colbride's family in Australia, yeah. and she, she was not well liked uh, in the family. That's all I know. Okay. Jo she has got a very jaunty sort of pose, yeah. though. I like yeah. it, maybe for the pictures. Um, I imagine that it was, was it a difficult life as well for these people? Or I think you were always moving. That's the thing. There's, there, yeah. there's no home life. You know, you're always moving. You've got to keep on working. You've got to be a hustler. You can't sit back. There was no dole back then. There was no gyro coming in. You know, you had to work or starve. As simple as that. And these guys had a whole lifetime of hustling. And, you know, they, they, they weren't just tattoo artists. These guys were businessmen. They were showmen. You know, some of them were con men. You know, lots of these tattooists ended up in court. Lots of these tattooed ladies ended up in court as well. They gave sometimes the adverts with a little bit um, over the top or maybe a little extra stuff that didn't happen to them. Yeah, there was one lady uh, whose name was Mrs. Bowman and Alice Bowman her name was and she was a tattooed lady and she put a poster up saying that she'd been kidnapped by Belgians and Belgians and uh, she was forcibly tattooed by a young French man. And it was all lies. She had never left London. And the police arrested her. And she got arrested a few times. And there was lots of them like that. There was lots of that, what they called showman's bluff. Yeah. You know, they had to draw the crowds in in order to feed themselves. So, you know, you would say you were the greatest tattoo artist in the world. That would draw people in. You know, you would say that you had the most beautiful tattooed lady in the world. That would draw them in. That's what it was all about. It was all about showmanship. Okay, so we've got to, before we move on to Dot, who we're dying to hear her story, uh, we're going to talk about Prince Valor, because yeah. he's the guy who originally got you into doing the research. Yeah. Um, so tell us about Prince Valor. Well, Prince Valor was born in Ireland, 1888, and his parents were show people. So they travelled all over Britain, all over Ireland, Wales, Scotland. And when Prince was born, they were performing in Derry. And Prince was brought up in the showman's life, travelling around with the family. And 1903, his parents 
sent him to work with Joe Kilbride as an apprentice. So they would have known Joe Kilbride because they would both be appearing on the same circuit at the same time. Oh, okay. everybody, everybody would know everybody else back then. Yeah. And Kilbride was advertising, he was looking for an apprentice. He took Valor on and he trained Valor for two years. And then Joe Kilbride wanted to go back to his hometown of Bradford. And he, he, he gave Prince all the equipment to get set up and Prince went to Scotland, he decided to go there. Mm -hmm. And he came to Scotland and he opened his first tattoo shop when he was 16 years old. Very young, wow. Very young, yeah, very young. He opened the arena. And then he became in great demand from the circus proprietors and the empresarios. People would send for him to come and tattoo at their attraction or their fairgrounds or similar, and Valor was on the move for the first 20 years he was in Scotland. He, oh. he travelled everywhere around Scotland. And he, but he eventually um, made his own, or got his own tattoo parlour in, where was it? He was in Glasgow. Oh, Glasgow, yeah. In, I think we have a picture of that. Is it right, called okay. the Valor? If, uh, Anybody's there, we can move on to that picture. Is this well, that the, Yeah, that's the first street that he had his first shop, and that was about 1905. Wow. So that's, that's what his first shop was, and then he eventually started to move around the country. He tattooed all over the place. And by 1920, he was tattooing in Glasgow uh, full time. And again, because he had children, he couldn't keep moving around, so he made his base in Glasgow, and he eventually opened a shop uh, on a girl street in Glasgow, and then he also trained his son, and that's why the Glasgow people remember Prince Valor because he was he had a presence in Glasgow for sixty years. That's and, really long, yeah. yeah. That's a long time. This is him as there's a picture here of Prince Valor. And yep. tattooing and school of musketry. What yeah. is that? What is that? Well, the school of musketry was a, a rifle range. It was an amusement arcade, and it's where young guys could go uh, after World War One, and they could have a shot of a, a rifle, you know, and shoot at targets and stuff like that. And Valor worked up the stairs from that in a small room up the stairs, and that was a famous Glasgow landmark at that time. Everybody knew Prince Valor. Everybody knew what his place was. And everybody knew it was above the School of Musketry, which is on uh, Jamaica Street in Glasgow, right in the centre of town. And he was there for many years and it eventually opened up Nargel Street. So there was a lot of money to be made. I mean, you said there was actually a lot of tattooists around as well, 70? Yeah. In, from your research. Um, and I guess because people were able to travel more, get around more as well, and the networks sort of started to grow. Yeah. I mean, tattoo was always popular. It, it came in and it went out of fashion many times. Yeah. You know, but one thing that must be remembered about Prince Valor, and it must set him aside from lots of others, Valor worked at tattoo in full time. He didn't do anything else. He wasn't a, a, you know, a, a dancer, he wasn't a singer, he didn't have any other business. So Prince Valor worked at Tattooing 12 hours a day, seven days a week. That was his job and his passion. And he must have felt it was a good enough living to train his oldest son to take over the business. Which I think we have a picture of his son, yeah, Bert Valor. And that's his son, Bert Valor, yeah. And the, the tattoos we see either side of him, the dancer in Kane and the other one, which says Aaron Gabra. Which yeah. Is, yeah, Irish. Um, did, Prince, did Bert do those or is it uh, Prince Valor? One of both. The one on the left-hand side was done by Prince Valor. Okay. And that was done in 1948. Wow. That was actually done on my neighbour. He's actually passed away now, but that was done on my neighbour. And he was a young man from Ireland. And uh, he was very homesick. And he went into Prince Valor's and he got that tattoo in 1948. Prince died the year after that. 
The one on the right hand side is a single needle tattoo by the man in the middle who is Bert Bala. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So I think, uh, yeah, there's some more work here by Valor. Um, some of it quite, quite detailed stuff as yeah. well. Yeah, he's obviously a very good artist. By the he's way. a great artist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He wouldn't have kept going in the business, I guess, if he hadn't been. So I think at this exactly. point, Terry, we'll have to go over to Dot. Now, um, yeah. but, but before we do, just um, to... The um, has come up here that it's really good. If you want to know more about the tattoo artists, the history, uh, go to Terry. And that's your website, Terry, yeah? That's the website, yep. Go to that and you, you can read all the history of these guys, Joe Bride, Prince Valor, all the other old tattoo artists from back in the turn of the century. Right. Well, we've got somebody now. Um, we... Want to say hello again, Doc? Thank you for hanging around. I hope Hi. I saw your dog there a little while ago coming in. <laughs> yes, he did. He wanted to sit with me. <laughs> oh, wanted, very good. He wanted to be famous. Ah, uh, well, he can come in if he likes. We don't mind. We like we like an animal on Zoom. So, Dot, we said you started at fifteen in Blackpool. Can you paint us a little picture of your life then? What were you doing, and? How did you get into tattooing? Oh, when I first got into tattooing, I actually got into the designing, designing. A friend of mine who apparently knew Eugene took me and introduced me one day and said, she does drawings. Are you interested in seeing some? And he said, yes. And really that's the beginning of it all. I started to go down there and, and draw and he kept them and I did more. And I was still at school, you have to bear in mind. I was only 15 then. Yeah. Um, and this was the school holidays. So I went back to school for another year. And then the following um, summer break, I just went down there and stayed every day, watching, learning, designing. And who, sorry, and who was Prince uh, Eugene? Who was he? How did, you know, you met him through a friend? He was a tattoo artist from... He was already a tattoo artist. He hadn't been a tattoo artist for long. He'd only been down there a couple of years, a, a year as on his own, really. Um, he'd never done it before. I don't know how he got into it or why he got into it. And it never occurred to me to ask. Okay. Um, I was just happy to be doing what I was doing. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, we have that's some it. The shack. <laughs> the shack. Yeah, that's actually um, that's actually a later. There, there is another shot which is the first cabin we were in. Okay, uh, and that's the older cabin. The There's one, one I one. went in at first. That one. Uh, okay, that's the that's first it. cabin. Um, Michael. And really, there was only room for two chairs: one tattooist, one customer and somebody to stand there and keep this lot out of the door. <laughs> um, and that was it really. And that keeping this lot out of the door was my job. So apart the... from being like um, really good at art and how, like, did you know anything about the tattooing world? Did you even- I knew nothing tattoo? about tattoos. I didn't even know tattoos existed. I'd never seen one. I had absolutely no clue. And it never occurred to me to be surprised. This is what gets, I think about it now and I think, why was I never surprised? I wasn't. I just sat there and, and handled this lot. I've never been short of standing up to people. You know, I, I've, I've always been there at the front uh -huh. and I've never been afraid to speak to people. Okay. And, and I think he found the perfect me, really, to keep them at bay while right. he was doing what he was doing. So as a 15-year-old... same time, I was learning. Sorry, go on. At the same time, I was learning. Oh, because yeah. Because while I was keeping these out, I was watching him. We were that close. I was watching him work and listening to him, what he was saying. And 
it, it, it just seemed to all meld together. The other picture you showed is the following year because we decided that this was a really bad arrangement. Um, so we took down the windbreak and we turned the door around and put it on the side of the building, which gave us better access. And it meant we had a little bit more room because you could hang over the half door and they weren't falling all over you and pushing. And so you could get the job done quicker and I could get them in and out faster. I'm really good at that. So you Next were fast and swift as well as the, good, the beautiful drawings. I could collect money with the best of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> was that part of the thing as well, Dob? Because I guess back it was uh, post World War Two, a bit later, and you know, finding a job and stuff. You were a young girl in school still. Was it a way like, ah, oh, I can make money doing this. I'm good at this. You know, were you drawn into it? No, never occurred to me. Really, I sound an absolute pleb, don't I? No, you don't. But I sat there and loved every single second of what I was doing. I didn't have any money. He never gave me any money. Oh. <laughs> I had all the clothes I needed, all the food I needed. And then as we began to get more customers, this, the end of this season of the cabin where we are here, uh -huh. at the end of that season would have been the end of the 1959 season. And we went away to the on the continent wow. I'd never had a holiday in my life and here I was driving down to Spain you know so well wow. that about it why did I need money you know I had nothing to spend it on so you, but you were gone. making it but he was he was the one who had the money but you oh, were yes. making I was, it for I was a kept woman <laughs> <laughs> but you were, you were working hard you were working hard for it I was working hard yes how many hours a day would you have been tattooing, Dot? We used to make sure we were open for nine o'clock because that was when the boarding houses kicked everybody out after breakfast. <laughs> so we wanted, to catch, we wanted to catch them right from the very beginning. So we were open for nine o'clock and it would get to pub throwing out time. And if they were still coming, we were still sat there. And there's always the loners that, didn't want to go home. So sometimes three o'clock in the morning, we're still there. Wow. You would actually, you'd need to be young to be able Get to- Get a lot of sleep in those, in the summers. No. Not at all. One of the things Dot, that you told me earlier on when we, before this, when we've talked is yeah. about something called the wakes, which I had never heard of before. Um, and they are something you can go on to tell us what they are but they're a seasonal thing that happened yeah. so can you tell us about the people who came and what the wakes were because i was born in oldham i knew all about oldham wakes and it's a fortnight when the cotton mills used to give their employees a fortnight to go and have a holiday unpaid by the way so people used to save up all year for this particular fortnight, and it became known as the wakes. So Oldham Wakes was round about the third week in July, in June. Whitsuntide was over, and then the wakes started. And first of all, it was Oldham, they started it off, and then it would go to like Rochdale, Bury, Blackburn, and, and, and round the cotton mill towns, basically. Um, and they Terry, would you. Terry might be able to tell you the exact date, but I believe that Glasgow Fortnight was the end of July. Um, and Glasgow Fortnight was when it was like, fasten your seatbelts, were <laughs> off, you know. Um, so they the would come on holidays to you? They drink and have to, sorry, Terry. They wanted to drink and have tattoos on and that was it. Okay. So the money just kept rolling in and you had to keep it rolling. So you stayed there and you did the hours, seven days a week, every single day, nine till three in the morning sometimes. So uh, like that holiday period when different sections and different industries, people who worked would come to you, come yes. to Blackpool, get tattooed. And you, you mentioned before, 
maybe somebody, the guys from, I don't know if it's from Grimsby, the fisheries guys will come and they give you fish as part payment? Well, we had our own fisheries industry in Fleetwood, which ah, just up the coast. Right. And obviously, the lads, when the ship, when the boat come, when the ship comes in, um, the young guys, all they wanted to do was spend the money. The older ones took the money home to the wives. The young ones came down to Blackpool, um, and we noticed that a lot of them had an earring in the left ear. So I being nosy, asked, and they said, boy, it, it, everybody has one. It's, it's the lads on the boat, you know. So, all right, okay. okay. So we went and got a, a, a machine, and we started piercing ears as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the you guys, were the money, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But the guys that came down were really good. We, we, we didn't really have any trouble from what we call the local lads. Um, they bring us bundles of fish in news, fresh fish in newspaper. And I remember we stuck one in the car one day and left it there on a hot day. <laughs> oh, it was awful going home, I tell you. But they, they were a good source of money in the times when the visitors were a bit quieter. Okay. And um, you and Eugene were began to, you were a couple. Um, and I mean, as well as earning good money, but you had to deal with a lot of different things. So as well as having a great time, you also had to deal because he was from Jamaica and you were a young girl. Um, you had to face a lot of racial intolerance that was happening yeah. then as well. Yeah. You said you, you had to learn to weight lift. Tell us about that. Well, like I said, I, I, I could use my mouth, but... I probably wasn't as strong as I should have been. So Eugene, he was a bodybuilder. He used to enter Mr. Jamaica contests when he lived in Jamaica as a young lad. Okay. But when he came over, he continued bodybuilding, but at home, he just had a set of weights at home. So I started training on the weights at home and I, and I got quite good at lifting. I could lift a good 150 pound. So, and, and, it wasn't until one particular day when some guys rushed the door um, and I could see they were making for Eugene. So rather than, I don't know, it's just me, but I jumped up and I jumped in front of him and I just let fly with a right hook and I hit the guy on right at his nose and it burst open and he flew backwards into his friends and they just domino effect back out of the door again um after that that's when we had another half we had a half door put on it's when we were in um the next the, the next shop which was on the other side of the stage um, so, so you guys had something unusual yeah you had three shops in the end so you were doing well people were coming um, I think we have a shot as well of Dor Dorothy and some of the beautiful flash tattoos. Like these are really beautiful, I think. Well, Beautifully th these done. were the money makers. Aha, uh -huh. the fast ones. These are the money makers. Okay. The swallow on its own was the one literally used to fly in and out. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was 10 shillings and sixpence when other people were charging five shillings. Oh. Now you see why we made money. Yeah, but there, there's a quality to these. I mean, I've seen various- we were frightened to ask for the money because we were popular. We knew we could make the money. So the, the small scroll and the bird were the two best money makers. Uh, and after that, the additions of more flowers or a bigger scroll or a bird carrying a scroll, they were all um, additions, depending whether he had a wife or just a girlfriend that he wanted to keep sweet or whether he had children, you know, and the snake was for the lads, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. So on the, on the whole, it was men coming to get tattoos. Were there some women as well? Occasionally you would get a woman in. Uh, I do possess a photograph of me somewhere of me tattooing a woman's uh, wrist and she would just have. We only used to do names on women at first underneath the watch strap. Oh. So that they could cover it. 
and that was the only thing we did on women at first was that uh, by your choice or was that their choice it was our choice okay at first yeah and then we realized that it was getting more popular and it was more acceptable so they were having them on the shoulder or or on the side of the chest you know mm -hmm. um and they were always my jobs i i got bosoms <laughs> Uh, I never did a chess piece on a man. Um, they were Eugene's. We each did our own thing. Designs. In, okay. in the third shop we had, it was big enough to have two tattooists working at the same time. So we could both, um, we could both, well, do as many as we could in a day. And we really used to belt them out. Could you could like, give us a, an average of how many you might do a day? I couldn't even begin to imagine, but bear in mind, if you were putting a, a bird on, I, I could, now if I picked a pencil up, I can do the outline of a bird in 30 seconds. Ooh, okay. it's, slower, it's slower with a machine, so sure. it would maybe take three or four minutes to put the bird on with a machine. Now, if they wanted colour, it would take longer, so it would cost more. Well, this was Eugene's way of thinking. Okay. So we charge them extra. So. Okay. So, like, just getting back to the the three shops, you're earning good money. So there was there was jealousy there towards you from others. Well, apparently, um, down down Bonnie Street was another tattooist called Jimmy. Now, Jimmy had taken over from Harry Lever, who started. I don't know when he started, to be honest, but he finished. When I'd been down there a year is when Harry Lever retired and disappeared off to Canada. But in that year, he had met Jimmy Gould, who worked on a waltzer. There was a fairground down the back, and Jimmy worked on a waltzer. And he hung around Harry's shop. Harry knew he was leaving, so he decided, oh, I might as well teach him. Why not? He's asking. I'll do it. So um, Jimmy got his wish. He ended up with Harry's shop. But he seemed to get the impression that once he'd got a shop, he was the best, you know, he was the greatest and everybody else was beneath him. And he came round one day and started bad-mouthing Harry and putting him down and all that. And, and I'm afraid uh, the sharp end of my tongue was not a pleasant place to be uh, that day. So he went off with a flea in his ear and I think he planned quite a few nasty things for Eugene in the meantime, but I don't think they ever came okay. to any uh, fruition. <laughs> you see, the thing is, uh, we ended up, I mentioned cars earlier on and I was joking really, but the first car we had and we got it in 1961. So that's only two years after I started and we bought an e-type. Wow. <laughs> I was so we waiting. <laughs> we bought an e-type. <laughs> and it was bright red with leopard skin seats and a white leather tonneau cover. You couldn't get more flash. Oh, that is so high. flash. The height of the flash, And yeah. immediately, of course, everybody... You got backlash. Yeah. There were a lot of people came round and they were, they were brilliant about it. A lot of people really liked it and they were honest about it. You know, that, yes, I'm jealous, uh -huh. but they were nasty about it. But gradually it began to creep in that bringing an E-type down there was not a, a wise move. Uh -huh. So we never, we never took it down. I had a little standard eight car that we used to go to work in because that, it didn't matter what they did to that, if they ever thought it was mine, but I have no idea. Um, we never took the cars down there. I think they may have parked it up a couple of times, but people did, didn't did like to see them. They thought he was showing off, which he was. Yeah, but, but then you earned enough money to show off if you wanted to. You were yeah, making a good living, you were working the hard. Thing, the, something about... Uh, the harder you work, the more famous, you know, the, the, the luckier you are. Well, that was their attitude. You know, Did your, so you, well, no. 
<laughs> did your family, um, what did they think about like this job you had, this man you had? What was, what was their reaction? When I first told my mother, I think she was too busy making something or washing up or something. And I don't think it really sunk in. Um, I took Eugene round to meet her one day and she shook hands with him and we went inside and we had a cup of tea and it was all very nice and then off we went and and that was it really. I never told her anything, but she never asked either. Uh, she had her own life. She was busy doing what she had to do and, and I continued to bring myself up and yeah. take myself into adulthood. You know, it was my choice. Well, you had a very interesting entry into adulthood if you started at 15 in back then in the tattooing world. Yeah, uh, and a lot of people, I think, would have been afraid. And I wasn't afraid. And I had to stand up to an awful lot of nastiness. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't just him that got called names. And it wasn't just him that got attacked in the street because I was always with him. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when you're faced with a knife or when you're faced with a gang of men that you know have been drinking and they don't have any respect for a woman, you know, and it can be very frightening, but oh, yeah. we, never, we never backed down and I never stopped doing what I was doing. And um, was that just because you were a white young woman and with a black guy? That was nothing to do with the tattooing? Um, the people who didn't know who we were, huh. yes, it was because we were a mixed couple and I was a young girl. There were people who did know who we were and realised that if we were walking home or walking to the car park, we must have a lot of money on us. Okay. And I think it was, um, you know, they wanted the money and they were quite willing to go for it. Well, but, look we got pulled out a few times by decent people who happened to be walking past or standing there, you know. Plus the muscles and uh, the mouth. You were able to stand up for yourself. Well, we used to, they used to try and separate us and they never could. We used to stand literally back to back or side to side. Awesome. And fortunately, the, the time with the knife, it was the money they were after. Okay. We had just um, coming past the front of Central Station. Unfortunately, a couple had seen what was happening and they were the old fashioned telephone boxes then, the, no mobile phones. Yeah. Uh, and they went and they phoned the police and then came out and said, shouted, we phoned the police, okay. which, yeah. Ran off. Saved uh us. I'm aware that the time is running out, and um, which is a shame because the hour goes so fast and you both have a lot to say. Um, but as we said to Matt last week, maybe there'll be another chance to do this again. Um, I have to ask you, Dot, looking back at yourself as a young girl, female tattooist pioneer, because there wasn't really, did you know any other female tattooists? And what does it feel like to have people contacting you now at this period of your life? Well, about at this? This period, at that period of my life, I only had ever heard of one other, and that was Jesse Knight. Yeah. Somebody told me about Jesse Knight and told me that I was the only other female tattooist. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting, but it, I was too busy, you know, <laughs> There was too much to do to think about things like that. Now, um, with all this that's happening now, I am stunned and I am absolutely humbled by the amount of interest. I can't tell you what it means after 50 years. Yeah. For somebody to come along and say, you matter. Yeah. Because I never, ever mattered. I was just a tattooist. And you had a tattoo yourself? I, I... Ah, somebody's been telling stories. Yes, I had, a, 
I had a beauty spot. It was my moment of uh, <laughs> madness, shall we say. Um, there was a tattooist called Mick Wigfall came to Tattoo in Blackpool and he came to visit and I was on my own and we got talking and I, I thought it would be a good idea for him. To, so he put, he put a, a beauty spot on and I thought, oh, nobody will notice that. Wrong. As soon as Eugene came home, he went, what is that? Well, it's a beauty spot. I'm taking it off. So it, about a week later, he came home with um, some Milton sterilizing fluid that you do baby's bottles with. Uh -huh. And he cleaned the machine and he tattooed the heck out of my face with this Milton sterilizing fluid. That's and when the scab amazing. dropped, when I had, to, I had to pick the scab off, and when it dropped off, it could still see it. So he did it all over again until okay. you couldn't see it anymore. So he's a bit. He didn't like you to have tattoos. He didn't mind making you making money for him, though. I wasn't allowed to do anything without his permission, really. Wow. Um, but that that's that's another story, and, and it won't be told. So okay. Um, I mean, what do you think about the visibility of tattoos nowadays, both of you, Terry and Dot? You know, the fact that people can, that it's, it's much, the, the stigma isn't there. Um, a lot more women have tattoos. I think it's fantastic. I love what has happened to tattooing since I left. I mean, I didn't follow it. When I left, I left and that was it. Um, I went to London. I worked in all the exhibitions. And then when I'd had enough of that, I came up, up back to Blackpool and I went to work for the council as an administration clerk. And that was it, that was my life. Um, and it never occurred to me to even mention, I occasionally mention tattooing or, because I used to doodle a lot. I used to draw in when I was bored and it was always the bird or a snake or something. And people used to say, oh, what's that? Oh, well, that and then I'd come out with a little bit of the story, you know, but I never ever told anyone the full story. Okay. Um, and was that Terry who came along and sort of found out your, the history, Terry? He, he, he's, talk about a man like a, a, he's like a dog with a bone. He gets this idea in his head. And what happened is I've put a picture of, me tattooing and the, the shop as a profile pic. I must have put in the right combination of words on the right day and up it popped. And he contacted me and said, there was a dot, Dorothy mentioned it. I don't suppose you're that dot. And my exact words were, I am that Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> so really I can't imagine, can't imagine his face. But his words were pretty happy after that. <laughs> so, Terry, it's brilliant that you are uncovering these people for us because then, I mean, I wouldn't have known about Dot if it wasn't for you. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, and all these kind of things. It's really important. Have you been enjoying finding out about people? Yeah. 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 The, the great I thing about Dot, most of the people that I'm researching have passed away. You know, I'm looking at people who had died 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. You can't ask them any questions. Dot was tattooing before I was born. And that's a, a period of interest to me. It was a big blank area in tattoo's history. Nobody knew anything about Prince Eugene. And I had searched for Eugene. I'd searched for information. I couldn't find it anywhere. I eventually found Dot. And in the first couple of weeks, the first six weeks, me and Dot <laughs> exchanged 19,000 words. <laughs> well, look, I'm not surprised from talking to you both on the phone a couple of times. The great thing about people who are interested in tattoos that I found so far, they love to talk. You've got stories as well. So, and happen to be very good speakers, very entertaining. So you it's barely, You barely touched on anything, I can tell you that now. I know. You barely touched on it. An um, hour is way too short. We should have made this like two and a half hours. 
definitely. Alma, sh shall we try squeezing we, in yes, some let's personal get, questions let's quickly get some then? Questions then, sorry, yep. These, these are really nice ones because thanks to Terry, Terry's been answering tonight for us, which makes my job a lot easier. But these are quite personal um, and quite emotional ones as well. Um, but the first one is, I, I, I've got to read this out from Miss Said saying, I'm proud of your mum. So that's lovely. Oh, and what an opportunity to be able to show the world and your family your past and, your, and what you're proud of and your, your narrative. So it was great. Um, uh, Dee says you're an inspiration to all lady tattooists, thank you for being so brave. These are lovely messages. They're absolutely oh. your story is incredible. I really hope you um you write this up or someone writes it up for you. Um Matt um from last week who, who's with us. Hello, Matt. Nice to see that you're with us this week. Um has mentioned that Dot was definitely one of only three or four tattooing women at that time. So the other one being Jesse as mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so a quick question <laughs> for you. Um for Dot and Terry, you can both answer this. And what's the worst tattoo that you've ever encountered? Read into that what you will. What's the worst tattoo you've ever encountered? Uh, well, there's always the clever ones that come along and try and shock you. Um, you know, the W on each cheek. It wasn't much to look at, but when they bent over, wow. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's the old fox and hounds, which Terry's probably heard about. It's a, a, a fox hunting scene and the fox disappears. Yes, Matt told us about that one. Yeah. yeah there's always people that will come with it. But I, ha I have seen some disgusting ones in my time. Because men aren't really shy. Once they come in that tattooing shop, they will tell you anything and show you anything. That, you know, things I wouldn't like to see again, shall we say. Terry, what about like, you? Any shocking ones? Not shocking as such. I've seen a lot of good tattoos, seen a lot of bad tattoos. I've did a lot of good tattoos and I've did a lot of bad tattoos. So I probably contributed to that myself. So. I mean, one of the lovely things you said about Dot when we spoke before was that she was one of the, the best. She's an amazing artist. Well, being an artist is great, you know, being able to draw is a great thing. Tattooing is a completely different thing altogether. There are great artists out there that can't tattoo. And there's great tattooists that are not great artists. But when I'm describing Dot to anybody, what I'll say is Dot had a great hand. Now, by that, what I mean is she just knew. Now, one thing you haven't touched on is this was what they called single needle tattooing. And any tattooist listening will know that's the most difficult thing to do. And Eugene was very good single needle tattooist, but Dot was better. And that's my opinion as a tattoo artist looking at Dot's work. Dot had a better hand. Can I just step in on that? That's a great question from Matt, which is uh, to Dot. If you picked up a tattoo machine today, do you think you could still do it? Yes, I do. Oh, and uh, people would say they'd pay lots of money to see that as a convention, so. I know, and I think <laughs> I've let myself in for something there, but I can't lie. I, I don't think I, I don't think I've lost it. Well, you could get yourself a new E-type on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or the Lamborghini she was talking about earlier. <laughs> Guys, it's been such a, do you have any more questions there, um, Matt? There, there is loads, uh, but oh, we are aware, yeah, of, aware time. of time. Um, what I'll do is we can, I can, I'll, we'll, we can record these and send them over to Dot, and yeah. we can, we'll put them up on the web. Listen, guys, to Terry and Dot, it's been a pleasure and an honour talking to you, especially Dot, because of your place in history. Um, fairly amazing, and Terry, you've been amazing. All these pictures. Uh, the images, all the work you do, finding people like Doc for us. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll hope to see you again another time because this isn't thank over. You. It would be fun. It would be fun. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Terry. Oh, Elmer, thank just you. a reminder, we're back on next week. Is that right?
Oh, we are, yes, I better say, we're back next week with two young female tattooists. Um, one is based in Portsmouth, um, Gemma, and one is based in London. Her name's Samantha, and they're going to tell us about tattooing now, the kind of stuff they use, and a little bit of history as well. Um, so please join us again uh, for the last of our series. Um, and thank you to Dot and Terry. That's it. Good night. Bye. Thanks Good night. very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye.